Mm. Welcome to Hot Off the Press, the show about new releases and the people that bring them to you. Uh, so before we get started, let's go around the room and have everyone introduce themselves. And we'll start with you, Natanya. Hey, I'm Natanya Barron. I am a speculative fiction writer, primarily writing dark fantasy and historical fantasy. And I'm here to talk about my newest book, Queen of None. Perfect. Uh, Kim? Hi there, I'm Kim Fielding. I write, I think, in pretty much all the genres, um, heavily in gay romance, but in a lot of genres and also uh, a lot of spec fic and, and some horror. Perfect. Uh, Jackie? Um, I'm Jackie James. I write um, uh, MM romance, um, a mix between contemporary um, and paranormal. And um, I'm here to talk about an awesome new series that we are about to launch, which is a multi-author series. Perfect. Uh, Nicole? I'm Nicole gibbons and I write uh, speculative mysteries. I write fantasy mysteries and science fiction mysteries, as well as I'm the owner of Mocha Memoirs Press. And so I'm here to talk about my new release, A Theft Most Foul. Perfect. And finally, Megan. Hi. Um, I'm Megan Maslow, and I also write MM Romance, but I like to write it with a bit of mischief, magic, and murder. So in other words, I like a little comedy in it. I like a little um, fantasy in it, and I certainly like a couple dead bodies because everyone knows a romance means a couple dead bodies. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll jump back to uh, the story of how you became a published author, and I'll start with you, Kim. <laughs> I love the story. So, you know, I've been, I wanted to be a writer. I remember being three years old and wanting to be a writer. And I was sitting there in Montessori school writing like little squiggles and thinking I was writing words. So, so I always wanted to be a writer, but I had, I had it in my head that I couldn't write a novel. Um, and I started writing, uh, I started writing fan fiction. If anybody's interested, it was Buffy the Vampire. It was Spike. There's about a, I've still got about 125 <laughs> Spike fanfics there, primarily Slash. Um, and, you know, fanfic is great for giving you practice and confidence and feedback and meeting up with this, with a, with a, a lot of other people. Um, so that was a really great experience. And, but I still had this idea, I couldn't write a novel until I heard about National Novel Writing Month. And right about then I wrote um, a really long fan fiction. It was, one of my first ones was like over a hundred thousand words. And I was like, you know, if I could write fan fiction that long, I can probably write original fiction that long. So I tried it for National Novel Writing Month and I did. And I figure if I can write a novel in a month, I can probably write a second novel. Um, and my 29th novel was just published um, last week. So I can write a novel. So that's that, that was, so I started off self-publishing um, and I have since branched out, I've got a, a variety of different publishers and I'm, I'm a, like I said, I'm a pretty, eclectic person so I publish in a lot of different genres just to keep myself from getting bored I guess. <laughs> All right perfect. Uh, Jackie how about you? Um, I don't think I honestly ever really wanted to write a novel. I wanted to tell stories. I was like a storyteller like if there were still bards I would be a bard. Like I would be going around telling stories everywhere. But unfortunately, you can't do that. So if you want to tell stories, you kind of have to put them down on paper now. So um, eventually, I just kept thinking I would do it and thinking I would do it, but never really did. And then I was in another group on Facebook that um, they were doing a, a NaNoWriMo challenge. And they're like, we should all write a novel. And I'm like, OK, I'll do one. But they were doing, well, they weren't doing gay romance. I'll just say that. And so I found another group to join and wrote my first one and I've been writing them ever since. It's been, I don't know, three, three and a half years now. And that's, I quit my job and that's just what I do. Oh, all right, Nicole? Oh, well, <clears throat> I've been writing for about 20 years professionally. Like, with, so in 98 was when I got my first um, novel contract for publication. 
Um, but I've been writing forever. I won my first essay contest when I was in high school in 10th grade um, <laughs> for like a district wide essay contest. And I'm like, wait, you guys have paid me to do this? Of course I'll do this. Um, and so went to, you know, university, got a BA in writing, which ironically enough is in rhetoric and not in creative writing. So I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty good with logic and, and rhetoric. Um, but I was a, a, a really big reader. And so I tell people often, beginning writers especially that reading is incredibly important to your to your development as a writer because this is and read everything like literally everything and so um I, that's how my journey started I got my first con I wrote a novel about it was very much um Terry um very much a waiting to exhale kind of influence novel so it wasn't even speculative fiction even though that's what I mostly I read um but that's what I was seeing getting published so that's what I wrote um and but then the second book I wrote was of course very much a <laughs> fantasy novel and so from there you know just kept packing at it reading my writer's digest trying to figure out how to improve my craft and where to submit things and how to get an agent and here I am 20 years later all right Megan um so I didn't actually start out writing novels. I started with short stories. Mm -hmm. And the reason um, I started with short stories was simply because I had young children um, and I also worked. And so I didn't have a lot of time and I was exhausted. And novels take, you know, you have to really be on all the time with your novel. And I couldn't do that. So I started out writing mystery short stories. Um, I would transition to novels only after my kids were a little older. And um, so, and, uh, a long time ago and now it feels like ages and it feels like a lifetime ago it was only a few years but it feels like forever um i was a cultural anthropologist and i spent most of my time overseas um and that was a really stressful life to live for my family for my kids for my husband for me um and so i wanted some i, I actually started writing in in order to come home um which is what ended up happening and so um i wrote my first novel in 2000, well, I guess 2015 would be my first novella. And then I did my first novel in 2016 um, and kind of found, found my stride from there. And it's funny because I always thought, well, I'm a short story writer. How am I going to write a novel? And now I'm known for writing long novels. I don't write, you know, I don't write short ones. <laughs> so I, I sort of split the spectrum and apparently I cannot write a novella. <laughs> so that may be my next hurdle. All right, perfect. Uh, Natanya. Well, I think like Nicole, I was just an incredibly avid reader as a kid. I think I had more books than friends um, by a pretty huge margin and spent a, just a, an inordinate amount of time in escapism and especially in fantasy uh, was really where I you know, was sort of the happiest. And I think when I got really into books, I would do proto fan fiction. So I would kind of rewrite myself into the story or change things about it. Um, both Nicole and I, again, we both love Westerns. Um, I loved the Young Guns movie so much in the 90s that I wrote like a huge Billy the Kid romance story with myself. Well, you know, a Mary Sue version of myself in the story because Billy the Kid needed a 15 year old uh, sister, obviously. And, um, and it was kind of through practicing that. I did that with The Stand as well. I did it with The Outsiders. So I would get really into a book and sort of hyper focus and really spend time learning the crap. I didn't think I even was aware of what I was doing. I just, I had to, I had to live in that world more. And eventually um, I did sort of take a, uh, I wanted to be in academia, but I wanted to be able to write fiction. And that's not really something you can do, but I did my master's studies in medieval uh, English. So I have sort of a more, you know, the academic slant to the work that I do, but it definitely influences the things that I write as well. I tend to write in medieval period, in the Regency period, in the Victorian period, in the Edwardian period. I just love fancy dresses and um, I love hidden stories of people and, and folks who uh, kind of marginalized to the edges. And that really worked into the work that I did in, in academia as well. Um, I, I published my first novel, which was not the first novel that I wrote, but I've been, like I said, I've been writing novel length things for a very long time. But my first novel was published almost uh, 10 years ago to the date actually, um, and was through a, a press called Candle Marking Gleam. And I had just seen, a, I had written it for another press. They had rejected it on the most ridiculous premises ever. It was one of those, like, you did not read this book. Like, I'm not, I'm not giving up because you just didn't, you didn't get it. Um, but I saw a call for, for books and I said, what do I have to lose? Um, Twitter has been always a huge place for me in terms of, of really just figuring out how to have the work of the businesses. And um, 
since then, yeah, I've, I've published about six different novels and novellas, short stories. I've done tie in RPG work and a bunch of other things as well. So it's, uh, it's not my day job, but it's, it's wonderful and I wouldn't trade it for the world. So, yeah. Perfect. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into the new releases. And since you've got something brand new to bring up, uh, Jackie, let's go ahead and start with you. Okay, well, um, so it's a new series. It actually, um, well, I'm not the only one in this little group here that's a part of it. Um, so uh, uh, Kim is and Megan is, and it was actually um, Megan's brainchild here that she came up with this idea that she wanted to do um, a series of paranormal, um, she calls them novellas. To me, they're not novellas. It's <laughs> her long riding heart. Um, <laughs> Uh, but um, so they're based on um, the idea that she came up with. She should probably actually tell us about the idea because it was her idea. But but my book is the first one coming out, but that, that doesn't mean it's mine. So Megan should tell about it. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, I can just say really quick and then we'll go back to Jackie's book. Um, so I had, again, come out of the short story genre, you know, ages ago now, it feels like. Um, and I, there's a volume that comes out every year that, that they have a call for short stories. And this last year's was Magic and Murder. And so I decided for old time's sake, I would write a story for it. The only thing was that it ended up as 12K um, and it needed to be the maximum of eight. And I wasn't willing to gut the story because it was exactly what it needed to be. Um, and I had set it in this magic emporium that move between worlds and realms and it could show up in different times it could show up and it only showed up in the same place one time and it only showed up for somebody who was in dire need and i thought you know this would be a really fun um shared element series to see what people could do with it because you could set it in you know you could set it in modern day Asheville. um you could set it in you know 1920s london you could set it in a complete you know, Tolkien-esque fantasy world. You can, I mean, there's all sorts of things you could do with it. Um, and so I ended up inviting, um, it's 14 authors total uh, and two, two pairs of co-writers. So the 12, you know, 12, I call them novellas, but they're, yeah, they tend to run a little long, <laughs> more novels. Um, and uh, everyone's done such an interesting and fabulous job with it. And Jackie is the first guinea pig for the series. I am, and mine might be the only actual novella. I'm not sure. It's possible that mine's the only. Look, I follow directions, okay? <laughs> and so when you give me parameters, I follow those parameters. <laughs> but um, no, mine is um, mine is actually set um, in some town somewhere. I, I don't know where I didn't name it, but somewhere here in modern day, here in this realm. And um, the Emporium shows up and this poor guy who has no idea magic exists is given something that he has no idea what he has or what he's gonna do with. And he tries to throw it away a few times, but it keeps coming back. And then somebody from another realm shows up and there's a reason why he has it. And this poor guy just doesn't even know what to do here because he's not from this realm and they don't have cell phones or internet or anything where he's from. And he has to try to figure out how to navigate our current world when he came from a place that's kind of a lot like medieval England, actually. So um, he's a little lost and the other guy doesn't understand magic. So he's a little lost. And it was just a lot of fun to write. It really, really was. And I had a blast with it. It was really, really great. I could have probably added about 15,000 more words and been very happy. But like I said, I followed the directions. <laughs> so what is the title of the book? Uh, it is called Night and Day. Night and Day. All right. Perfect. Uh, it'll, Nic it'll, be out, it'll be out January 14th. January 14th. Okay. Uh, Nicole, how about you? What's uh, your new release and the idea behind it? All right, so my new release is the second in my Kingdom of Avis mystery series. Um, it's called A Theft Most Foul. And honestly, I like love Dan Brown novels. So this is my attempt at a heist, a fantasy heist novel where there's a religious artifact called the Five Feathered Crown. So I don't know if you guys have read um, my Kingdom of Avis series, but 
<clears throat> it's set in, of course, the Kingdom of Avis, which everyone is in a bird caste system, and they're um, matrilineal, and everyone worships the goddess, um, which was a phoenix, okay? And so the order is very much like the Vatican, but there are five um, five bird castes that are comprise the order. So the owl is the pope, um, the cardinals are the cardinals, um, and um, the doves are bishops and hawks are the investigative arm of the order. So in every nest, which are providences, and in each city is at, it's called an egg because eggs are in nest. So every egg has a uh, security patrolling police force and those are made comprised of eagles um, but when the eagles can't figure it out they ask they submit a request to the order for an investigative hawk um, and the, in my in, and the protagonist of all of all these stories is Prentice who's a hawk and the, the brilliant thing about hawks are their ability their supernatural ability to see the unseen so when princess engages her hawk-like powers she's able to see things that other people can't see as far as like things that have transpired uh, spiritual residue um she can magnify and see things that the human eye can't see. Um, but the problem with this power or this ability is that the more she uses it, um, the harder it is to switch back to her human eyesight. And over time, Prentice will go blind. That's the case for every hawk, like her mother and her mother before her. That's that's the downfall of the ability. And it's and all hawks are women. So it's passed down through women, right? So, um, but in a theft most foul, the five feathered crown, which is this religious artifact, the legend is that the goddess took the feathers from each of the five ruling uh, ca case, all five birds in the order, and put together this magical crown. And it's deaf to anyone who touches it. Um, so it's on display at the University of Sullende, and it goes missing. And Prentice is called to go investigate. The issues are many, because she went to university there. So there are lots of um, nostalgia and some she has to investigate her favorite teacher who's a rook so rooks are very smart so all the professors most of the professors at university are rooks and so she has to investigate rook renner the the curator of the museum who's also like her favorite teacher um, she's also paired up with a condor and condors are like the muscle for my hawks so she's paired up with Galen who she hasn't seen since university and they didn't leave on good terms um so she's trying to do this major investigation it's like it's press heavy right the whole kingdom wants to know what happened to this crown because it's such a big deal who stole it um the guards were really injured in the process there's some illegal magic going on there's all kinds of stuff in this story but I thought most foul is, is of course the second one in the series and I love it. It is I love being an Avis. I love the ability to just play and take like all of these interesting things about birds um, and, and, and actually take those characteristics and behaviors and put them on people. It's hilarious. Um, of course, there are a million bird puns for those of you who enjoy puns, um, but it's a fantastic um, fa fantasy mystery series. All right. Perfect. Uh, Megan, what about you, your new release? Okay, so as I mentioned um, with the Magic Emporium series, um, one thing I should have said is that when a character goes into the Magic Emporium, they're always given an item. And most of the time, and in fact, I think in all the stories, it's not what the protagonist was expecting, you know? So if they're fighting a dragon, they think, aha, now I'm going to get a sword, you know? And then they're given something like a feather, um, you know? And, and so if everyone has that moment of what? <laughs> um, which kind of makes it, I think, a little more fun for people. And then, you know, for authors, because they get to really figure out, well, why did you get this feather? Um, or whatever the object is. So with mine, um, I wrote about a um, incubus named Nicodemus, or Nico for short. And so he's a lust demon, but he is much more concerned with happily ever afters than one night stands. Um, his magic does not inspire lust. It actually brings true love together. Uh, and so he doesn't fit anywhere. You know, he's, he's very much this misfit. He's been thrown out of his legion because, you know, he can't work, he can't work the sex clubs because the people will keep falling in love, which is, you know, kind of goes against. Um, and so his, his big 
life goal and his dream is to become a cherub, uh, you know, so he can go around and spread love. And of course, he's seven feet tall and looks ridiculous in a toga and has this little teeny bow and he goes, you know, he's, he's apprenticing to them now. Um, and unfortunately for poor Nico, he has kind of bad luck and he ends up with um, some new cherub technology. He ends up lassoing himself with the lariat of love to a um, warden who is kind of like the FBI of the world, of this particular world, and a grumpy FBI agent at that, who's on the trail of a murderer. And so having an, a seven foot tall incubus lassoed to you is not exactly convenient when you're on the you know, trail of a, of a murderer. Um, and they end up getting sucked into you know, this investigation um, and poor Nico all, you know, always has sort of a target on his back. <laughs> as well he kind of falls into things a lot um and sir flame or flambeau illum because he is a, a phoenix shifter um you know is always sort of having to get them out of of these issues and so you, you know they have to solve the crime they have to figure out how to get separated um no magic has seemed to work to separate them and you know maybe in the process even fall in love perfect uh natanya Sure. So um, Queen of None, which is right there, came out about a month ago. And uh, my short pitch is that it's the thesis that I never got to write. So like I said, I, I had a background in academia. I had one of these dates I will finally decompress after the trauma of my thesis problem and the teacher that I had that completely pieced out on me and having to rebuild it from scratch. And so it was not something that, you know, really felt a part of me, but um, I really wanted to do this particular story justice. And I, and I got the idea from reading actually uh, 14th century manuscripts where there is a sister of Arthur that is mentioned that disappears in the works afterwards. And I remember reading that and thinking, wow, if he had a full-blooded sister, what is her story like? And who would she be? And why is she nowhere? So I essentially created a, a, a story where she has a prophecy that she will be forgotten. And so I could kind of use that to give an insider's eye to everything happening in, in Camelot and all of the main players that everyone has come to know and love. It's um, de de definitely if you've read Circe or um, books of a similar ilk where they kind of take a character that's marginalized or doesn't appear and the main events of the mythology kind of happen around them. That's very much what she is, but she also has a lot of power. She's able to like clearly not really have true agency the way that a male knight would be but she's able to find ways into her own power and uh, really wreak her own havoc and revenge on people and also have some pretty steamy scenes with some knights of the table round. But um, she does start the series as a mother. Um, the other really important story that I wanted to tell was that in the Middle Ages and you know, really up until the early part of this century, women were married at very, very young ages. So she's, she's betrothed at 12 and married at 13 and then very quickly after a mother. And so when she starts the story, she's in her mid thirties, but she's got a 20 year old son <laughs> and twins that are, they're 16. So I love this idea of taking a character who normally would be kind of ushered off stage. You know, as soon as the women are married, they've brought their dowries, they've done their, their, their purpose, they fade away into the background continuing to build her out, have her be a woman with passion, with, with wants and needs. She's a flawed character. She's a, it's a first person narrative. She's not always reliable, but uh, through that, I was really able to kind of play a lot with the Arthurian realm because that was what I studied primarily in school. And, you know, I absolutely love the King Arthur stories and love to hate a lot of them usually is more like it when I'm watching the films. But I was able to have a lot of inside jokes, a lot of medievalist Easter eggs. So I've had a lot of people who've been able to read it and go, I know what you were doing there. That's awesome. Um, and kind of thumb my nose a little bit to some of the stuff. But also it was just a, a wonderful experience. I actually drafted this novel uh, about 10 years ago. So I wrote it directly after my, my debut, which is this book here. But I... I could not find, I got one rejection and I just shelved it and I shelved it for years. And every year I would take it out and I would edit it again and I would kind of get almost ready to go. And then I would give up and I would go chase another shiny thing. And then I had, um, then I read, and I, I think this was on, actually I was reached out to by uh, Vernacular Press and they said, you know, we're starting a press. We, we wanna see if people that we, we know have potentially have novels that might fit what we're looking for. You know, they're saying dark speculative. And I said, well, you know, take a look at this and tell me what you think. and it resonated with them and that's kind of where it's been. So it's been it's been very strange to promote a book during a pandemic 
and um, it was very well received by critics, which was also really weird because, you know, the world is like burning and you're like, I want to be really excited that Kirk is like my book, but I also feel like how much enthusiasm is appropriate at the moment. <laughs> like hitting your writer milestones is great, uh, but during a pandemic was a, a very, very odd balancing act but I am I'm really grateful that this has resonated with readers even my little sister is reading it right now which is you know really cool she keeps texting me she was texting me today like who would you cast as Bedivere and who do you think is Chris Hemsworth would be a good Arthur I was like sure why not right why not don't we all want that to happen in our lives so yeah that's it's uh it's definitely a work of my heart I do plan to write more in in the world but um for right now Queen of None that's where that, that's the channel we're on right now <laughs> all right thank you so much uh, Kim, how about your book? So my book is also in the Magic Emporium series and mine is, I think, is it the fourth book I think that comes out. It comes out February 4th. I just got the cover today, so I'll be doing a cover review. I'm very excited about it. And it comes, I, I don't follow direction, so it's more like short novel length. It's like, I, I just did a word count. It's 56,000 words, 56,004 words, as a matter of fact. So it's, you know, short novel-ish. Um, and it came to me from kind of two inspirations. One was I've always loved fairy tales, and I, one of the fairy tales I like is is some of the the versions of Sleeping Beauty. But I started thinking about you know the the princes who tried to rescue Sleeping Beauty and failed, you know, and they ended up caught in those briars and killed, and that's very sad. Um, so one of my guys is Morley, and he's he's a prince from some little kingdom, and um, he's. He, he, he would really just much rather be baking bread, which none of his family appreciates. So they send him off on this quest to uh, to rescue the princess and, and he fails. He ends up in the brambles um, and dies. And that's the end of the first chapter. And it's not the first time I've killed off a main character in the first chapter, um, but so he dies. And meanwhile, um, we've got another guy who is in modern day um, America. His name is Baxter. And he ended up breaking up with his boyfriend and uh, moving across the country from Chicago to Modesto, a small city in California for a new job, which seemed like a really great idea in January of 2020. Um, and then of course he ends up getting stuck in lockdown in his little house on Drury Lane um, and he doesn't know anybody and he's working from home and he's pretty miserable and he takes up all the same kinds of hobbies many of us have engaged in <laughs> over the last year so he you know he's he knits and he gardens and he he bakes um, and um, he, he, he um, does stuff with sourdough um, and he um, also starts dabbling a little bit in magic his his a uh, late great aunt was a witch perhaps. So he has a spell that she left him for, for happiness. And he, he tries that and he ends up making a visit, a visit to the magic emporium. He's the one of the feathers, by the way. And, um, and the, the feathers bring him and, and Morley from the other worlds together. And it's, you know, they're, they, they end up on a quest and it's a little bit difficult because Morley's from, they're literally from different universes and have very different, which is a problem. Um, and, um, but they, they end up on a quest and I, I enjoyed it because it's kind of the bringing together, you know, you think about Modesto is not, I live near Modesto. It's about the least exotic place you could possibly think of, but think about how exotic something like Target would be to someone from this sort of medieval fantasy world, you know, you know Target and television and video, you know, so that was really fun to kind of bring them together and, and, um, and there's baking. And so I ended up putting some recipes in at the end too. So that's fun too. And what's the title? I'm sorry, it's called The Muffin Man. I guess I should say the title of my own book. Right. Yeah, it's called The Muffin Man. All right, perfect. Uh, so now let's, um... I know I've asked you, Nicole, at one point this question, but I also know as a writer, this answer changes constantly throughout your career. So tell us a little bit about your writing routine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you think I have one. Um, so <laughs> That in and of itself is a good writing routine, right? <laughs> right. No, I, well, my routine is usually I write, and I think I've described this before. I don't, because 
I usually write uh, in a notebook. I usually hand write out notes. I usually write scenes out longhand. It makes my brain slow down. It makes me be immersive. Um, and so then I usually do that. And then when I feel like I've got a significant chunk for a chapter or a scene, I will, I also, uh, I will type it into Word. But most of the time I write longhand. Um, I write snatches of scenes as they come to me on paper. Um, so I actually have a Samsung Galaxy. So I have for the, like the last five years just been writing, like I'll be in the kitchen or I'll be out in the garden. <laughs> Thank you, uh, you know, special time um, for my gardening skills. Um, so I'll be out and I'll go, oh, that's a good idea. And I'll just take out my stylus and I'll write notes. And then I'll, at some point, I'll take all those notes to, and then compile them into a scene or into a story. And so that's pretty much my routine. I know some people are way more disciplined. They sit down at a desk. They, you know, have their tea. It's approximately two hours. They get 2,000 words. That is not me. I am chaos with my writing routine. I write when I can and when it strikes me. Um, but I do try to do write something um, each day. I'm not always successful, but that is the goal. So when you put all that in on your phone, do you type it out or do you use a, like a dragon speaking program? I write it with my stylus. I literally write longhand on my, cause I have a galaxy. Um, so I can no. write, get a page and I write my notes and then the notes I can have them, galaxy will convert them to um, okay. word and send it to me. That's why I was wondering if it converted it for you or it if you It will. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, Megan. Um, well, so. I'm a pantser, um, so I never really know what's coming out. Um, I, I don't, if, if I know the whole story when I start, I, I feel like I've told it. So I wanna be surprised too. Um, and I tend to like fairly complex stories that have lots of pieces that weave together. And I always get to about the three quarter point where I feel like, okay, I don't know if this is gonna work, <laughs> um, but it does. So, you know, um, so my writing routine mostly is um, I tend to throughout the day, I will try to sit down and do little bits of editing here and there. Um, I sprint six days a week um, at, in the evenings from 10 PM to midnight with a friend. Um, and that's where I get a lot of my words for the week. Uh, you know, especially right now I've got, you know, my kids are home. Um, I'm oh. home. My husband's home. Um, it's real hard to have a block of time to sit and actually write. So nighttime, it is pretty much for me. Um, but even in, even in better times, I'm, I'm a night person by nature. So if you would, like when I wrote my dissertation, I wrote it from probably nine at night to three in the morning. Like that, those were my prime hours. And I would still do that if I didn't have kids I had to get up with in the morning and, and for school. So, um, I tend toward a later schedule anyway. And I don't write things down very often, but I will say at about the three quarters point of a book, I guess I'm old school because I have to print at some point onto paper. I have to see about when it's at about the three quarters point. And it's the only way I can finish it because I need to be able to see what I have to see this over like the, the overarching structure. And then I know where I'm going for the end. So so did you fight with the whole night routine initially thinking that you had to do stuff for the day or did you just naturally migrate over to night and go, oh, this is perfect, this is what I should do? You know, I, I have tried to switch my schedule for so long because when my kids are in school, it would make the most sense for that to be times when I'm writing. Um, I, can't, I, can't, I can't brain before 11 a.m. Like there is just nothing there in terms of creativity. I can do admin. Um, but, but in terms of the creative brain, it, it really, I, I need to have a couple cups of coffee. I, I need my, you know, to get going. Um, and so I've just learned that I, I will try to get things done while they're, you know, away. Um, but I naturally just, you know, it, it hits six o'clock and suddenly my muse shows up and kind of knocking, you know, and all of a sudden all the ideas are coming and little bits of scenes are running through my head. And I, I kind of have a sense of where I'm probably going to go that evening. Um, but it, in the morning, you know, it, it reminds me of this, you know, in the hospital, it's like, <laughs> that's me in the morning. It's not there. All right. Perfect. Uh, Natanya, what about your routine? 
So I, I started out as a pantser, um, but uh, for me, my life was just not going to work. I was not going to be able to write, especially I have a special needs child. I have a full-time job. I have another child. I travel a lot uh, for my job when it's not, you know, these times. And I, I had a couple of years where it was really, really difficult for me to figure out what to do because I was so used to being able to kind of just sit down and, and at a whim be in, inspired. So I had to really work hard at, at restructuring my approach. So I did quite a few books with, um, you know, real spreadsheets, like doing five point plots or seven point plot, you know, worksheets and planning things in advance and kind of knowing I'm going to sit down and write the scene and that scene. And then, it, and then what really ended up happening more than anything is that I found uh, kind of like Megan was saying that evenings to me were the best time for me to write. And generally I try to write about 500 words. I usually get closer to 1500 if I'm going to sit down and do it. And I make little micro goals for myself. And uh, I tend to do NaNoWriMo every year, which always helps me kind of push, see where I'm comfortable at. And I'm pretty comfortable at that 1200 to you know 1600 words. And I can pretty much do that when I sit down to do it. That doesn't, doesn't always happen. I think also building in that flexibility, like Megan was saying is really important um, because you just have to give yourself a lot of grace that if you're going to have the energy to be a writer and to do, to write beautiful things, you also can't make it so much of a chore that it's, it's, you're going to dry yourself out. You know, you just become completely exhausted and, and with everything going on, especially this year. Although I think a lot of us who for, for myself and a lot of people in the, in the communities that I'm part of that have special needs children, it doesn't feel that different in a lot of ways. <laughs> I mean, it's different, but we're so used to being in crisis mode. We're so used to kind of walking on eggshells. It's made it harder and easier in a lot of ways. But um, for me, you know, writing is a hundred percent a coping mechanism. Absolutely. It's how I achieve, hi you know, hyper-focus. I have ADHD. It's how I order the world and my thoughts. I don't really experience emotions very well in the moment. I process them through the art that I do. And um, that's why, you know, writing is not something I can give up. And thankfully I'm married to a man who understands that. And, you know, there were a few rough years where it was like, why are you spending all this time writing? And the sort of, you know, if you're, if you're not writing to make money, then, then why bother? But that eventually we get through that. And the kids now see it. I, I'm working on a, a, a Regency uh, queer sort of pride and prejudice with witches right now. And my daughter came over and was like, I said, I need to write a hundred more words. And she's like, well, that's a lot. And I said, no, this is a lot. And I showed her the whole draft, which is about 67,000 words. And she's eight. And she was just like, you wrote all those words. <laughs> I said, yeah. Um, I definitely employ what Nicole was talking about when I'm stuck. So if I'm having a hard time for God knows what reason Mercury's in retrograde or, you know, the wind's blowing in a different direction, our brains sometimes don't don't cooperate. I definitely write longhand or I'll write poetry or blog posts or just make sure that I'm reading. If I'm not reading, I'm not writing. Um, I have, I have to be reading stuff. I love audiobooks. Audiobooks have helped me read so much more. I'm a very good reader, but I attention span is very short. I tend to skip and not really focus as much. So I go hiking with my fantasy novels and I hike miles and miles and listen to stories and I come home and I'm ready to go. So I think a lot of that is sort of, to use the gardening metaphor again, it's really about preparing the soil and getting out the weeds and figuring out how you're going to make it work. And every, every plant, every story has a different set of requirements. So being flexible, I think was the most important thing I learned and, and not beating myself up about not writing. It's just that there's like the most useless thing ever. It just only spirals. Um, Brene Brown talks a lot about shame and how shame is just one of those emotions that just eats away at you. And it's, it's not worth your time, but we've been, a lot of us were brought up in worlds where we were made to feel ashamed for the art that we created or the stories that we had to tell. And so we have a very complicated relationship with our stories. Um, and I think it's really important to push through that and just, you know, write from your heart, write the stories that you want to read. That's yeah. Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, Kim. So like a few other people here, I also have a background in academia. My day job is I'm, I'm a professor and um, not in anything whatsoever having to do with writing. I teach criminal justice um, and I'm a I'm department chair too. So I spend, you know, basically my day is spent doing administrative horrible stuff and that kind of stuff. And, and I've always liked to write at night because I'm also a, a night person. The 
the really good thing, you know, when I like to look at silver linings. So one of the silver linings of the of this current situation is I, I'm my classes are are uh, non synchronous, so I've been able to adjust my schedule to <laughs> to my personal timeline. So you know, I do my my day job stuff during the day, and I start writing usually around eight or nine at night, and then write till about two thirty or three in the morning, which is when my muse is awake and it's also when the rest of the household isn't um you know I'm, I'm, my kids are older they're 17 and 21 so they're not you know they're, i'm not quite one of them's way of college so i'm not you know i'm not not so hands-on there but still you know my husband's working from home my younger daughter's going to school from the room i'm in um so it's so by by, by late at night the household is quiet it's just me and the cat and and i can write and um I'm, I'm a pantser, so I usually start with, you know, an idea of who the characters are, where we're going to start, some very basic idea of what may or may not happen, which I usually end up changing my mind anyway, and, and go from there. And I am really good with, with like goals and deadlines and charts and schedules. So I, I aim for 2000 words a day. Um, and, and I, you know, sometimes I go over, but I can usually hit 2000 seems a pretty reasonable amount. And I don't let myself um, go back and tinker whatsoever. Um, you know, I might have to go back and check a name because I can't not remember names for the life of me, but I don't, I'm not allowed to go back and edit or change things or tinker until I finish the first draft. Um, and then I can go back and mess around with things as much as I want. I'm also only, I only, I'm only allowed to write one thing at a time, you know, so the shiny isn't always calling at me and, and, and I'm not always kind of feeling that tug to, oh, you know, you should go back and change that scene and I'll just, Make myself a note and do it later and I feel that that's a really good way for me to make forward progress and and if I'm really stuck um you know I still want to hit that 2,000 words so I will just write I'll write anything I mean stream of consciousness anything because I figure I can always go back and and cut the whole thing and it's better to write nonsense than to have be staring at a blank page and sometimes you know you can write you write and you go back and you look at it and you say, well, you know, okay, maybe it was 2000 words of nonsense, but maybe a hundred words in that are worth keeping. And so even, even if at the time it feels like it's horrible, it's, it's worth doing it just to kind of get past, past, past that block. Okay. Uh, now, working the day job that you're talking about, you mentioned that there's some very draining days involved. What do you do to, I guess, motivate yourself to sit down and write after one of those horrible, horrible days? For me personally, writing is, is my therapy. Um, I, I tell my husband, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's great. Instead of paying a therapist, I make some money off of it. It's if, if I've had, you know, if I've had a day where I've been stuck in interminable meetings with annoying people, then that night I'm going to write a scene where somebody gets tortured and I'm going to feel so much better when I'm done. So it's, you know, it's therapy. It's, it's my treat. It's, you know, my, my reward for getting, getting, getting through the stuff I got through in the day. And it's, it's, um, it, you know, it puts you in such a totally different headspace. It's a really good way of, of removing yourself psychologically from whatever's been going on during the day. So it's good that way too. All right. Thank you. Uh, Jackie, what about your routine? Well, um, so for the first two years, um, I had a full-time job. I worked in human resources at a hospital and I wrote at night when I got home. Um, and I did that for the first two years. I, uh, I'm not really a night person. I guess I'm the only one apparently, but I'm, I'm really not. Um, maybe it's just because I'm so used to having to get up and go to work in the mornings. Um, so uh, a year ago, whenever I started staying home, I shifted everything to, uh, so the writing is like during the time that I worked. So um, I have a group of four or five, five some days. We have one who she, uh, she lives overseas. So sometimes it's, you know, nighttime for her, but sometimes she pops in. Um, group of people that I sprint with in the mornings and we, uh, we get started and, um, I sprint Monday through Friday, every single day. Um, I try to get 3000 words a day. If I get 3000 words a day, I only have to write for four because I actually have a weekly goal for my word count. Um, I don't always get the 3000. So I usually end up having to write that fifth day. But um, when I first started, I wrote seven days a week 
and I probably was at it 12 hours a day. I bought into the idea that, you know, I had to release a book every month, right? Because that's what self-published authors are doing. They're releasing a book every month. And I was putting out a book every month and I was writing seven days a week and just absolutely burnt myself out. It was crazy. <laughs> um, about uh, about a year and a, about a year and a few months ago, I just I like completely shut down. I'm like, I don't even know how people do this. I don't know how I'm supposed to do this. I had quit my job. I, I wasn't done yet, but I had quit, and I was like, I wonder if I can take back my resignation, you know, because I just can't. And then so then I like stopped and took a step back and realized that you know you don't really have to put out a book a month. It doesn't have to be that way. And you really can write the book that you want to write and you really can write at a reasonable pace. And so I may spent this last year really making that my goal. Um, I, I released um, five books less this year than I did last year. Um, and uh, I mean, personally, uh, they were better books, right? Because like, I didn't feel like I had to turn them out in three weeks. So um, it was a really good year and um, I'm really looking forward to next year. I, I am, what do they call it when you're both a, a plantster, I think, right? I, uh, I pants my writing for like the first six or seven chapters until I get a feel for who the characters are. And then I'll plot out all the rest of the details for the rest of the book. So I kind of do a mix as far as that goes, but I have like three books ready to go kind of and um but i'm just i'm taking them at a slower pace and i'm really trying to not you know be insane just because i'm here for eight hours a day and that's my work day doesn't mean that i have to write for eight hours a day so i'm trying to be more reasonable we'll see how this year goes <laughs> so for people that don't publish uh what else takes up those the rest of the eight hours after you get your three thousand words oh Right, uh, advertising, doing Facebook ads, doing Facebook ads, doing all the Amazon stuff, doing all of the, you know, all of the submitting everything to the end the, and doing all of the editing and all of the, yeah, there's, there is so much admin stuff that goes with that. Like there really is. Um, I, I need somebody to do that for me, by the way. I'm, I'm really just a writer. <laughs> I would like to say I'm really just a writer. I'm not really all that, but um, it, it's a full day. I mean, it really is. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, so, Megan, uh, my next question uh, goes back to the story. Tell us something that surprised you uh, with writing it, either in something you learned about yourself or the story or a character, especially as a pantser. <laughs> okay, so I actually did have an epiphany on this one. Um, I, I don't think I ever said the name of the story. By the way. <laughs> that is possible. <laughs> um, and um, the, the interesting thing for me, well, wasn't necessarily the content of the book. I mean, I really, I, I have to say, I really enjoy it. It's become very clear to me that I like to really have a little bit of comedy, a little bit of mystery, and a little bit of magic with with almost everything I do. Um, and that I that I like to really cross those genres. But what was what I hadn't really realized is that the reason I tend to write longer is that when I started writing short stories, the thing with short stories are that you know it, they're one threaded. You follow a particular line, you know, from beginning to end, and, and and it's a very finite piece. But with novels, suddenly you have all this room to play. Um, and I'm, but I'm very much of the of the opinion that every scene has to justify its existence. If it can't, it goes. But what I found is that because I like the the murder, because I I have to world build for magic, I end up doing a couple threads at the same time. I you know double or triple thread. Um, and I, when I weave those, and then I have to always interweave them so that they're creating some sort of a pattern. Um, and I didn't realize how much I actually needed all of those elements until I was in this book and, and how much that in, always influences the story I tell. Um, so that was really, fun. that, that was a, a kind of an epiphany for me with this one to see it because usually, usually I'm writing um, a series and, and, you know, my own series. And in that one, um, 
you know, it's like a comfortable sweater I put on and I love that series and I, I, I just settle snuggle right in and get to it. And this was a whole different set of characters. And so I, I got to look at things in a very different way. Perfect. Uh, Natanya. Gosh, it's, it's hard to say. I think, you know, there's just, there's so much that surprised me and a lot of them came through characters. I, I purposely tried to write characters in this story against my own likes because I think it's kind of dangerous when you love something like Arthuriana, you have your favorites and you want to make them, you want to paint them in a really positive light. I really wanted to take the ones that I love the most and kind of expose them a little bit and make them a little more complicated. So there were a lot of really interesting things. And, and if, if you're familiar at all with Arthuriana, you know that over the centuries, characters go from being heroes to villains to back to heroes again, to you know foils, to romance people. So there's, a, there's definitely a long history of that. And, and, and that was definitely part of it. I think, um, I think what was kind of surprising for me was even, well, there were two things because I, I tend to write a lot of queer characters as a queer woman. It's just a really important thing for me to talk about. Um, but this was kind of before my own re real visibility, before I was kind of out there saying, hi, I'm bisexual. This is a huge part of my, ex my experience and who I am. Um, but this is definitely a story that, that does have queer themes, but it's not the queer themes of, hey, I'm queer and everything is great. And this is how the world works now. And it's a perfect world. It's very much about the characters that are queer still being stuck it kind of doesn't matter in some places whether you're accepting or not what the culture will accept of you and kind of that journey i think was important too because i think we need you know stories that are queer from all all along of that discovery and that there are characters in the story that would not necessarily self-identify yet as queer but i know that they are um, or they're just they're just at a different part of that that tale. So that was definitely surprising for me. Um, and then I think I, I kind of didn't really realize I was putting my toe into romance necessarily, like with a as the romance genre. Certainly, Arthurian romance is kind of a slightly different thing. But the I I just I in particular my main character, like I said, she has some some lovely trysts with some handsome knights. And you know, if you're writing the story, you're gonna she's going to write it down on paper if you did it with so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and you want people to know. I mean, I, it was kind of, um, I'm not afraid of sex scenes by any sense at all, but um, you know, my publisher was like, yeah, this could definitely be cross-marketed as romance. And I was like, huh, I guess you're right. And he also called it a big gay fantasy epic. And I was like, I guess that's one way of looking at it too. So, you know, I think once, once it kind of gets a little bit further from you, sometimes you have better insight in it um, than when you started. Thank you. Uh, Kim. I think uh, one of the things I really realized when writing this particular book had to do with world building. And, you know, I write a lot of spec fic, so I do a lot of world building. And I'd always known, um, you know, sort of in, in, in theory that you do just as much world building when you're writing a contemporary. Um, but this is the first time I've ever had a book that was literally set in the contemporary world and in this totally magical fairy tale world. And so I could directly compare what, what I was doing there. And in some ways you almost have to do more in, in the real world to, 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 to invoke a very particular setting um, in a, because in a very particular feeling. So, so for me, that was, that, was, that was a real, I wouldn't say a learning process, but I guess an eye opener to realize that it's just as much work and just as much fun really to, to try and give readers a very specific idea of what's going on in Modesto in 2020, as opposed to this fairy tale world and my imaginary time frame. And you, you still have to be just as rich in the details. Um, and you still have to, to give the same kinds of clues and make things just as three dimensional, you know? So um, in the Modesto parts of the story, it's in September. And in September, we were basically, we couldn't go outside because the, the air was unbreathable. unbreathable. I mean, the, the, the air quality was, the, the, they do it with, you know, I forget what, the, what it stands for, but it's like parts per million or something. And it was like 500 something, it was purple. And it was, it, you know, I mean, there's ash falling in the sky. It was very apocalyptic. And, you know, so, so to try and convey that is in some ways almost as difficult as trying to convey what it's like to be, you know, going on a, 
a, a, a quest through a fairy tale forest and meeting up with a basilisk, which also happens. Um, and you, you still have to, you still have, because not everybody was here in Modesto with that. So you still have to give that kind of detail and you still have to think about as a writer, how you're gonna convey that. And so that was, that was a good experience for me to see that directly. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. Well, so the cool thing is, see, I haven't read Kim's yet and Kim hasn't read mine yet, but um, ours are, it sounds like ours are actually very, very similar, I think, because my guy is from a magic realm and he's here in this world and living in our world and trying to figure it all out. And I think that kind of really, like she said, it kind of made me look at a lot of things here a lot differently, right? Because, you know, my guy is like, you know, what do you mean there's not magic here? You just push that button and it changed the channel on that box that's showing pictures. And he's like, well, it's not magic. That's just, she's trying to explain how a remote works. And he's like, so it's, it's, it's like energy. Yeah, that's what magic is. I mean, the guy is just like, and it was just really, really interesting, like to trying to like, look at like the stuff that we do every day from a different perspective as how someone who like has never seen you know, the internet or a cell phone, you know, and he's trying to, you know, just, you know, he's just, he's, he's just absolutely, you know, obsessed with cars because, you know, this is like the coolest thing ever, right? You don't have to like ride a horse to get where you're going. You can like actually take this car to get there. And he, th he, he rides dragons where he's from and he thinks our cars are cool. Right. So like, it, it just kind of gave me a different view of like looking at our world and how, you know, how a lot of the stuff that we have really is like, I, I think I actually said, um, but if I said it here, it's going to be so much more boring because there's not any magic. And then I kind of had to create the magic here. And that was a lot of fun because I had to look at a lot of things that we do every day different. Yeah. Perfect. Nicole. I did do something different this time with uh, a fifth most foul. I actually took um, uh, an outline and did beats with it. I've never done that before. I used to just go by a natural rhythm um, with my stories and it seemed it, that worked fine with kill three birds. Um, but this time I thought I would try to um, actually follow some beats <laughs> like the save the cat beats but it had been modified for a mystery um, and so I did that and it was it was hard I felt like I was being placed and I was being confined but it actually helped the story a lot and so I was it helped me it helped guide me when I would get to a point in the story I'm like uh what to do next and I would just look at my beat sheet and be like oh we need to go here and so that was uh, as a recovering pantser <laughs> that was really helpful uh in terms of like plotting out my mystery I still was able to maintain the part of my mysteries where I don't know who the bad person is or who the culprit is until the character knows um so it's a surprise to both of us I'm like huh print this that's who it is okay that's who it is um so I still able to do that even with the beat sheet which was worked better for me than like a traditional outline so that was one of the things I did differently with a theft most foul versus kill three birds and I think it helped the story a lot uh in terms of like those beats hitting those beats for a mystery so it worked really well all right perfect and I do want to thank everyone for coming but before we go let's go around again and Tell people where they can find you on the internet. And we'll start again uh, at the top with Ms. Tanya. For some reason, my, my mic would not unmute. Well, now it is unmuting. <laughs> unmuting. Um, I've made it pretty easy at, that you can usually find me at Natanya Barron just about everywhere. So Instagram, Facebook, NatanyaBarron.com. Um, the only exception being TikTok, where I was convinced to join by my eight-year-old daughter and weirdly have had like a pretty large following, uh, which I'm at Natanya Books over there, um, also on Pinterest and pretty much all there. My new book is available where all fun books are sold. Um, I love when I hear people ordering it from their indie bookstores. So please do that if you can. Thank you. Uh, Kim. So I'm also, I try and be consistent too. So I'm K Fielding writes pretty much across the, 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 the internet. So I'm um, Instagram. I have, I, I'm tire, terrified of TikTok. I'm too old for TikTok. I'm 
probably my daughters would be appalled if I went anywhere. No one is too old for TikTok. Trust me. No one is too old. <laughs> no, my, my, I, my 20 year old would, one year old would just die if I went on TikTok. So, <laughs> so I, I, because I am obviously too old. She's, she's, she's still not too comfortable with me being on Instagram even. So, so, but I'm, I am on Instagram and Facebook and, and Twitter and I have, and my uh, website is kfieldingrights.com also. All right, perfect. Uh, Jackie. And like the other two, I'm Jackie James pretty much everywhere. Um, just remember, it's just with an I, not with an E, because you'll find, I don't know, some other strange person if you try to put an E on the end of Jackie. Um, but uh, my website is JackieJames.com. Um, I'm Jackie James on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. That's I'm pretty much everywhere. All right, Nicole. Yeah, so my Twitter um, handle is in the right there uh, versus Nicole G. Kurtz. Um, you can also find me at NicoleGivensKurtz.net and at Facebook at uh, Nicole G. Kurtz. I also run Mocha Memoirs Press. You can totally get me there and find me at MochaMemoirsPress.com or at Mocha Memoirs uh, on Twitter and on Instagram. All right, and finally, Megan. Uh, like everyone else, uh, I'm pretty consistently Megan Maslow, and so MeganMaslow.com. Um, I probably hang out the most on Facebook. Uh, Twitter can be a bit of a dumpster fire, <laughs> so I get chased away sometimes uh, by that. But um, so yeah, I'm usually around. But I'm usually around Facebook. I'm pretty easy to get a hold of or to find. All right. Again, I want to thank all of you for coming in, and I want to thank everyone for watching. Next Thank time. you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Bye. <laughs> All right. I think that went really well. So much the safety. recording button is still on. Yeah, Jim leaves it on for a while so he can get some, uh, you know, outtakes if uh, things <laughs> go crazy. He's Blackmail material. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting to see one of those, you know, videos that just includes all the bad things. He's very quiet. You see, he's still on mute. He hasn't said anything about leaving the recording button on. <laughs> he's probably still dealing with, you know, His one other of the problem. yeah. 5,000 problems. <laughs> so, but this was, this was wonderful. Thank all of you for coming in and participating. And like he said in the beginning, you know, we will definitely be in touch and keep you in mind. And if you have any ideas on any programming that you don't see us doing, mm -hmm. it's probably just because we hadn't thought of it yet. <laughs> so let us know. It's like crowdsourcing right. is good. Right. It's a mega brain. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys. Have a good night. All right. All right. Thank, thank you. you everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.